Hi, this is Tom from ZeroToFinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be explaining how SGLT2 inhibitors work. Now, SGLT2 inhibitors are used in type 2 diabetes to help to reduce the blood sugar levels. They differ slightly from most anti-diabetic drugs, which work by either increasing the insulin in the body or increasing the insulin sensitivity of the cells of the body. And the objective of increasing the insulin or the insulin sensitivity is to get the body to take more glucose out of the blood and to store it in the tissues. And that's how they reduce blood sugar levels. However, in SGLT2 inhibitors, they work slightly differently. They work by causing the kidneys to excrete glucose into the urine. And by excreting glucose into the urine, you reduce the amount of glucose or sugar that's in the blood and the rest of the body. For this video, I'll give you three examples. The first is dapagliflozin, the second is canagliflozin, and the third is empagliflozin. And if you remember these three, you're unlikely to come across very many others. But the clue is that all of them end with gliflozin. There's only one real indication for these medications, and that's type 2 diabetes. Let's go through the mechanism of action. Firstly, in order to understand how SGLT2 inhibitors work, we need a very basic understanding of the function of the kidneys. So let's go through that briefly. So to briefly go through those, the kidney is made up of about 1 million tiny tubes called nephrons. And these nephrons are responsible for filtering and balancing fluid and electrolytes between the blood and the urine. Now the nephron consists of five main landmarks that you need to be aware of. The glomerulus, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. Now the glomerulus and the convoluted tubules are up in the cortex of the kidney, and the loop of Henle and the collecting duct pass down into the medulla of the kidney. How it works is water and small molecules are filtered from the blood into what we call the filtrate in the glomerulus. And then varying amounts of water and molecules are reabsorbed from the filtrate into the blood along the tubules, loop of Henle and collecting ducts. And what's left in the filtrate becomes the urine. For the purpose of understanding SGLT2 inhibitors, we're most interested in the proximal tubule. Glucose is actively reabsorbed in the proximal tubule along with sodium. Normally, glucose is filtered passively into the filtrate in the glomerulus, and under normal conditions, all of this glucose is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. So you shouldn't find any glucose in the urine. Where the blood glucose exceeds about 10 millimoles per litre, then the proximal tubule doesn't have enough capacity to reabsorb all of it, so you'll start to see glucose appearing in the urine. Let's look a little bit closer at the proximal tubule. There are cells that line the proximal tubule that have a molecule called the sodium glucose linked transporter, which we shorten to SGLT, on their luminal side. This transports sodium and glucose together across the cell membrane and out of the filtrate. This sodium and glucose then passively diffuses out of the other side of the cell into the interstitial fluid where it's reabsorbed into the blood. This sodium glucose link transporter is a target of the SGLT2 inhibitors such as dapagliflozin and as the name suggests they inhibit the action of the SGLT2 molecule and prevent the glucose that is filtered out of the blood in the glomerulus from being reabsorbed. And as a result, the glucose is secreted into the urine and the blood glucose stays low because it's not being reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. And this is how they reduce blood sugar and reduce the amount of sugar in the body. Let's look at the side effects. So as you would imagine, one of the main side effects is glucosuria, and this is glucose in the urine, and that's because this is the main mechanism of action of these medications. The second side effect is increased rate of urinary tract infections. Increasing the amount of sugar in the urine provides a great environment for bugs to grow. 
Therefore, it does increase the risk of urinary tract infections and candida infections, which we commonly call thrush. Another side effect is weight loss, and this is because when you excrete a lot of glucose in the urine, this can cause an osmotic diuresis, which means that the high level of glucose in the filtrate draws water into the urine through osmosis. So the water is moving from the area of low concentration of solutes into the area of high concentration of solutes, meaning a lot of glucose, in the urine. And this causes the person to lose more glucose in the urine and to lose more water in the urine, which leads to frequent urination, dehydration, low blood pressure and weight loss. The final and quite rare complication is diabetic ketoacidosis, notably with only moderately raised glucose levels. And this is quite a rare complication, but it's one that's worth knowing about, firstly for your exams, and secondly so you can bear it in mind when you start seeing patients who are on these medications. So thanks for watching, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget there's plenty of other resources on the Zero to Finals website, including loads and loads of notes on various different topics that you might cover in medical school, with specially made illustrations. There's also a whole test section where you can find loads of questions to test your knowledge and see where you're up to in preparation for your exams. There's also a blog where I share a lot of my ideas about a career in medicine and tips on how to have success as a doctor. And if you want to help me out on YouTube, you can always leave me a thumbs up, give me a comment or even subscribe to the channel so that you can find out when the next videos are coming out. So I'll see you again soon.